and I want to thank you for coming. I'm also really pleased that the content of this particular program is one uh, is one on leadership. Uh, leadership is something that's very near and dear to my heart. And um, since I've stepped out of the insource group, active management of the company, other than just you know on the board, I've spent a good time of my my time now traveling around the world on leadership programs in Central Eurasia, Southeast Asia, and uh, the Middle East, and particularly in helping young and up and coming leaders in those various parts of the world in developing countries understand some concepts of Western leadership uh, to apply to a part of the world that, that didn't have leaders. They just had dictators and autocrats and kings, and um, leadership is a whole lot different than, um, than uh, an autocrat or a dictator telling you what to do, or a boss telling you what to do. So I couldn't be more thrilled um, to have um, Calvin and, uh, and, and Phil here to talk about some things that they've obviously demonstrated huge success in. And that's leadership and entrepreneurship in many ways. So I'm grateful to both of you for uh, for coming, and thank you for giving your time and fill your facility here for us to participate in this conversation. I'll tell you just a very little bit about InSource Group, though I know that a lot of you um, are our customers and do know a bit about us and what we do. But the InSource Group has been around since 1992. Linda started it a long time ago out of her house. It's one of those entrepreneurial success stories that's really been around for a long time. I joined her in 2005. Um, and help initiate the contract uh, side part of our business, and we have been business partners for ever since. And the nicest part about us being business partners for all these years is that there's not very many, very many private businesses that people can stay partnerships for as long as we have. And I can tell you that in the 25 years, and this is the absolute honest truth, and this is one of the things I'm most proud of, in the 25 years that Linda and I in business, we've only had one major falling out in 25 years. We've had some disagreements. But we've had just an unbelievably cooperative relationships. And I know, so I know it can be done. Um, I know that businesses and business people can work together. In fact, I know that people in society can work together as long as we go at it with the right, the right idea and the right reasons. So I just want to introduce to you our moderator for today. Um, and I'm also very pleased to be able to do that because Julian Pacino and I have known each other for quite some time. We both met at an organization called Dallas Social Venture Partners, which is a, a non-profit non uh, organization deeply involved in philanthropy and philanthropy education for people here in uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area for the last 20 years. Uh, he and I have been partners in the organization for quite some time. And not too awful long ago, um, uh, Julian called me up and said, I understand you're involved in some leadership stuff. And I said, yeah, I am. Why? He said, well, I'm really interested in leadership stuff myself, and I'd really like to talk to you about what you're doing. And we got an opportunity to sit down in his office one day and spend an hour or two talking about you know concepts of leadership as as we provide you know in the programs that we do around the world, and just leadership in general and how leadership differentiates from management, and you know because I see those as two completely different skills, and um, ever since that I've been watching some of the things that Julian's been doing and was thrilled to have the opportunity to refer Julian to Jim Thompson, our CEO, to help us continue the leadership growth and leadership contribution and the development of the people that work in the InSource Group. And so Julian and the InSource Group have had a very, very profitable, useful relationship for the last year and a half. He's done lots of great things for our company, and I think all the people from InSource that are here can talk to you in some of the things that, that uh, he's done. And I want to just uh, thank him and thank you for being here. And uh, Julian, I'll turn it all over to you. Can you guys hear me back there? Yes. Let me get this thing clipped on right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Julian Placino. I'm a senior recruiting and staffing professional, the recruiting lead at Bottle Rocket, and the creator of the Pathways to Success podcast. Now, although I personally have been working a corporate career for more than a decade, I've actually been very entrepreneurial. But only now am I starting to gain clarity on how I uniquely might be able to create value within the marketplace. That being said, I do know one thing for certain, and it is the value of learning from the successes and the mistakes of others. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is exactly what we're going to be doing today. And I'm thrilled to introduce you to our distinguished panel now. <laughs> and that is you, you're absolutely right. <clears throat> Phil, do you mind coming up? 
I'll go ahead and set this on your lap here, sir. This is Phil Romano, and he is an investor, entrepreneur, artist, and nationally renowned restaurateur. Involved in the restaurant business for over 50 years, in the course of his career, he's created over 25 concepts. He is the only person in the restaurant industry that has created more than two national concepts. To date, he has created six. Fuddruckers, Romano's Macaroni Grill, Spaghetti's, Cozumel's, Rudy Country Store and Barbecue, and Eatsy's Market and Bakery. Fuddruckers has opened units in more than 150 locations worldwide. Romano's Macaroni Grill now operates in more than 190 locations in the United States and Canada. And Phil, of course, is the founder of the Network Bar, this beautiful venue we're in today. Thank you, Phil, for being with us today. And next we have Calvin Carter. Calvin is the founder and CEO of Bottle Rocket. He believes that exceptionally innovative technology redefines our lives. For over a decade, Calvin has pushed Bottle Rocket to become a renowned connected lifestyle specialist that connects future-focused brands and their customers through sophisticated yet simple experiences. His visionary and entrepreneurial spirit earned him the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award in 2013. Now, with over 200 Rocketeers and over 450 award-winning preeminent experiences to date, Bottle Rocket continues to transform how their clients compete and win in the marketplace. Calvin, thanks for being with us here, sir. So ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, we have two incredible entrepreneurs with us today, and I can't wait to get this kicked off. So before we get started, Calvin and Phil, is there anything you want to say? No. All right, we'll go. <laughs> Sounds good. So just to set the expectations of the conversation flow today, we're going to hit three main topics. And the first is going to be mistakes and lessons learned. Number two is business best practices. And lastly, we'll close with business and life philosophy. Starting with Phil, question for you both. We're starting with mistakes and lessons learned. What would you consider to be your best mistake and what did you learn from this? Wow, um, best mistakes. I don't know if you qualify mistakes as, to, as being one of your best moves, but. I think uh, pre-planning, I think, is, is the thing that I make mistakes and I don't pre-plan. And examples like New York, when we brought ETs in New York City, we went there and, and uh, spent a lot of money on it. It was in the bottom of Macy's in uh, downtown New York and Manhattan. And um, we opened up. And we had the unions to contend with and everything else, which we planned that. And, but the customers, the, what they do and their, their culture, we didn't, we didn't understand it. You know, when you're going to be successful in, in business, you, you got to understand what the customer wants and what they need and, and their, their habits. So we're, we did well, but people were coming in using this like a food court. They weren't taking the food out. We couldn't figure it out. You know, and they come in there instead of filling up the their their basket, they'd come and use us like a, a a restaurant and fill up their belly, and that wasn't that wasn't good enough. That wasn't giving us the sales. Well, if we did the right research, finally we, we trying to find out. I did some research, found out why we were doing it, and we found out that in New York City, people don't take food on public transportation. Okay, they don't take it in a subway, don't take it in a cab. They they, they go in a subway. Nothing. Come up in their neighborhoods, shop, go home. So I said, "Wow, that's piss poor pre-planning. Didn't happen." You know. And, and another episode was, so we we just instead of trying to change the culture, we just closed it. You know, in the wrong place, wrong time, didn't work. Closed it, went on, licked our wounds, and went. Another one was when I did a, a concept uh, a long time ago in San Antonio, a thing called "I Just Get Out of Fuddruckers," um, and. Um, I wanted to start another concept, and this was back in, back in, uh, in, the, see, in the 80s, mid-80s. And I wanted to start a healthy food place, all right? Maybe before it's time. Time is important. But if everybody was, uh, you know, talking thin but eating fat. So I opened up a place that was like a, called Sticks. It was this 
oriental cooking, uh, just kebabs and all that stuff come in there. Very nicely done. It looks like a little theater type thing and kind of stadium seating. You look at all the cooking down there and everything else. Well, the thing, we opened up and it went good. No, no, no smoking, no liquor, just beer and wine, you know, and, and great food, all healthy food, oriental and, and all that stuff. So we're doing good, but weren't doing good enough. You know, I wanted to build these things out. Like we had to do about, I wanted to do about eighty thousand dollars a week. I was doing about thirty, thirty or forty thousand. So again, I did a, uh, got my marketing company come in and said, "What am I doing wrong? This is my my business, creating concepts. How did I go wrong here?" So they looked at it and they said, "Well, it took them. They did intercept. They did all that stuff. It took them about maybe a month to come back with an answer." And they said, "Well, here's here's your problem." He says, "You got you got good news and bad news." He says, "Well, I said." Give me, uh, give me the good news first. So the good news, he says, you're attracting, you're attracting more competitive business than fast food places are. People like your product 100% and like it, really good. And I said, well, what's the bad news? He says, the type of customer you're, you're attracting is the educated, making sixty thousand dollars plus. Now this is in 19, uh, 1975. And he says, that in San Antonio, there's only 6,000 of these customers. He says, you're in the wrong place. Okay, so we didn't match the marketplace in the marketplace. And this is, you know, we'll get to it later, but that's the key, I think, to anything being successful, is to understand your market, what they need, and you got to give it to them. And uh, so just piss poor planning is probably the mistake I made that I, I learned the most out of. Thank you, Phil. Calvin, over to you. Um, so I, before I reveal my mistake, I, I want to um, share just kind of briefly how I look at mistakes. Uh, so there's a, there's, a, there's a great thing that uh, a group called Stegen taught me, which is like the victim's triangle. And so if you can picture a triangle behind me in one corner is the persecutor, one is the savior, and one is the victim, it's very normal for humans to kind of like settle down in that, in that victim mentality. And when you have a victim mentality, when a mistake happens in your life, you feel like it was done to you. You feel like, oh, well, all I can think about are the problems created by my mistake. I can only, only worry about all the external factors that led me to make this mistake, which is deflection of blame and things like that. Um, but if you have a, a different triangle, the virtuous triangle, you, you have um, your job as a victim is to immediately recognize that you're acting like a victim and say, I've got to stop focusing on the problem and I have to focus on what I want to create. I want to focus on what I want to do next. And when you, because when humans think about future things, they totally change their mental outlook and they totally change their energy and they totally change the impact that they're going to have on the people around them. No one wants to see their CEO you know, crying in the corner because he or she made a mistake. He wants to see the CEO say, we made a mistake, we're gonna learn from it, and now we're gonna move forward immediately, and this is where we're gonna move forward to. So, but the mistake, um, it, uh, I believe, I've, I've made a lot of big mistakes, so it's hard for me to pick one, I'll just pick one, because it had, had damning effects on our, um, our financial performance a few years ago. So, um, you know, I started Bottle Rocket out of my house, grown it, you know, organically over time. Now it's a legitimate, you know, business with, you know, um, stratification of roles and hierarchies and everything else. But there was a, a time not too long ago when um, I was, dr I was way too reliant on certain individuals, uh, especially those that reported directly to me, my leadership team, but with, which is fine but without any sort of succession plan. I believe that at least in the first couple levels, if you would, of your organization, you have to know off the top of, off, like right off the tip of your tongue, who is going to replace that person one day? Because two things, number one, it's good for succession planning and it's good for um, sustainability of your business, but it also, allows the person that would one day be replaced to step up to something else bigger and newer in your organization. And I did a terrible job of that. I took for granted those relationships. And when we uh, did lose to retirement, a, a very, very, very gifted executive, it 
hammered us. It rocked us to our core because it, it wasn't until he left that, I, that we realized how reliant we were on him, a single individual, for so much of our, our revenue production. And so we had just a, a really crappy period of time before we could do that. So what did I do? I immediately focused on what I want to create. Well, I want to create an environment in which we are not just built for greatness, but built to last. And so now we focus a lot more on governance, sustainability, repeatability, um, plan B, plan C, plan D, because we have something really, really, really meaningful to protect. Maybe earlier in our, in our, our, our company, we didn't have as much to lose. Now we have a significant amount to lose, and we have to really be focusing on, um, on that kind of sustainability. Thank you, Calvin. Phil, when you do make a mistake, how do you mentally recover and put yourself back on the path to productivity? Well, you know, I think um, I'm motivated by, by the fear, the fear of failure. You know, I'm, I, I work my ass off. I make it work because, I'm, because I don't want to fail. And when I do get something that fails, I, I look at it and I understand why, how, or what I did wrong. And it's usually I start off with a, with a premise that I, I do. I, I give my concepts a, a constitution. I give them a bill of rights. I say, here's five most important things about this concept that if I deviate from any one of them, you know, it's not, it doesn't act the same, doesn't feel the same, I feel the same to the public. It's not going to be the same thing. I've, it's like our, our Bill of Rights and our Constitution. You know, now some, once in a while they're being challenged, but but still, if you if you keep them, you got you got something. So the same thing with your with your with a concept. It's got to keep your Bill of Rights. And every time I've had a concept that failed, I look at it and it's failed because I didn't stick to my Bill of Rights. I didn't stick to my Constitution. I deviated from it. I compromised it. You know, and this is the same thing in life. You know, you got to have your, got to have a constitution, got to who you are, which you are, and go from there. So, I think um, it's it's having having a constitution and stick stick to it. Having your game plan, call it a business plan, whatever you want to have, but you got to stick to what you what you say you're going to do. And you got it's got to be part of your culture. You got every one of your employees know about it and understand it. Thank you, Phil. Question for Calvin and Phil: When faced with the decision that could produce a mistake, what framework do you use to analyze and mitigate business risk? So I'll have a, a fairly non-traditional approach to this because um, I, I, I agree with Phil that, uh, not just Phil, but all of us and humans in general, our greatest fear in life, other than buying a new car or speaking in public or whatnot, is, is the fear of failure. And because of that, it can, it can create positive impact in your life by, by working and never giving up. But it can also hold a lot of people back from doing the best work of their life, from being everything they can be, because they want to only do things that they have a relatively good idea that they will succeed at. No general wants to take his or her uh, army onto a, a, a battlefield that he or she hasn't already determined. It will be a, you know, they will win. So in the business of having the best and the brightest in the nation working at Bottle Rocket and building new things that haven't been done before, haven't been done in a way that we're going to do it for our clients, um, I feel compelled to create an environment that not just is tolerant of failure, but invites failure into its walls. So what I, and I when, whenever a new rocketeer joins Bottle Rocket, I'll, I'll meet with them and I'll go over this, this, um, this material and I'll always talk about the power of failure. And then the idea, and kind of like the punchline at the end is like, you never really fail until you give up. So the idea is that if you're on the right track and, it's, and you don't give up, all those failures really aren't failures. They're just part of the formula of the eventual success. And so that's like how I look at, you know, failure. I, look, I think I look at it a little bit differently than, than, than others. And there's a great quote that, uh, well, there's a quote that I thought was great called, what would you do if you knew you would not fail? 
And so you're like, oh man, I would try this, I would try that. And then I've heard a better quote, which was, what would you do if you thought you would most likely fail? And the things that you would be willing to do in the face of failure, the biggest fear we humans have, are probably the most dear um, things in your life, the most the, that you love the most, that you're most passionate about, and you will be the ultimate worldwide winner in because no one loves it as much as you do. Calvin, something I've often heard you say is this idea of failing fast and failing early. Can you give us an example of how that philosophy has served Bottle Rocket? Yeah, I'll just use Bottle Rocket's first year. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, so when when I uh, so I mentioned before, I started Bottle Rocket out of my house. On March 6, 2008, Steve Jobs announced that he was opening the iPhone to third-party developers. On March 7, 2008, I called my attorney, started an LLC, and started Bottle Rocket. And the only thing I knew to do was just try things. Because there was not a, like, there was no one I could point to that was successful in this space. It was literally had started the night before. Kind of like, you know, a race that's never been run and they fire the starting pistol and you're on the front, you don't even know how to run this race. So what I did was um, we built a lot of apps on our own accounts. We built a lot of different ideas. We came up with the ideas, we put them on the app store and the plan was to, 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 to sell those apps and make money. And I found out the hard way, it's really hard to make money on the app store, 99 cents a pop. And so, but the thing is, is by doing that, all that failure turned out to be our ultimate weapon in success when we, in December 20, 2008, January 2009, we pivoted to build, at the time, apps. We do a lot more than apps now, but apps for others. And so National Public Radio was our first paying client, and it led to, uh, within months, uh, ESPN and American Express and Disney and other like big organizations that we were so humble to work with. And, the, and I, I had an opportunity to ask them later on, like, why'd you pick me? I mean, I, I never told you I was working out of my house, so maybe you thought I was some big company, but why'd you pick me? And they're like, well, you're the only one that we talked to that had more than one or two apps in the app store. You had eight, Calvin. I'm like, well, you didn't know I'd be making money on those, but, but they were good. They really were good. They just weren't making any money. And, and they said, and also, you have this ability to, like, sit down, think about an idea, draw it out and present it within hours or, or days. And, and it's because I had to do that to make those apps. I had to do that to make those apps. So the biggest failure, financial failures in the first 12 months of the company ended up being our most competitive advantage when we pivoted. Thank you, Calvin. I love that. Bill, so the original question was when faced with a decision that could produce a mistake, what kind of framework do you use to analyze and mitigate business risk? Well, you know, putting it. Did I turn it off? I thought I heard it turn it off. Our batteries. Yeah. <laughs> the needle is doing it. Yeah, this might be a little bit weird, but. Uh... <laughs> well, there we go. Okay. okay. Um, okay, question again. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so when faced with a decision that could produce a mistake, how do you analyze and mitigate business risk? Well, what I do is I do brainstorming. I get my group together, you know, five or six people, whatever it is, and when I, when I create a concept, okay, I, I guess I'm a, a creator, I create things, and it's like a wheel. My organizational chart is a wheel. I'm in the middle. And everything else is around around me. Everything comes comes to me like a like spokes. Okay, so I, I deal directly with everybody. I call all the shots. I make all the decisions because I got the I got the image of what I want it to be. I know what I want it, I want it to create. So we talk about it. We get everybody coming. Everybody has their their input. And the first thing I say is, well, will it help me reach my goal? To help me reach the goal, we'll do it. If it doesn't, we don't. If it's a maybe, we don't. So everybody understands what we're trying to get to. Okay, but you gotta have a gatekeeper, else you just go crazy you're trying to create something, you know, you want a horse and you create a camel. But you gotta have that guy that's got the got the vision of what it wants to be, and he's the one that's calling the shots and saying the final yes and no. I've got a follow-up question. 
Do you? <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Julie. Yeah, no um, so, so Phil, I, 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 <laughs> Phil, I love how, what you just what you just said, and this um, I call it uh, a czar when you have someone who is kind of has the the first and last saying on on everything, and it's a really great process when you're trying to generate something 100% new because it only sits in one person's head. Um, and we use very similar techniques when we are creating something new. But when, but is there a point at which you pivot when like, you get, let's say, the first five or six locations open and now it's time to go to 150? Is there a pivot point that you change that, that hierarchy and structure? Um, more, of a, more of a versus creation versus, versus ex, not execution, but um, management, ongoing management and growth? Yeah, absolutely. And a mistake most entrepreneurs make is taking it, you got it? Yeah, you're trying to take it to the moon themselves. Okay, you create it, get enough going, so you establish what it's supposed to be, establish the culture, establish what you want it to be, and then you turn it over to professional management. But before you turn it over, you gotta create that bill of rights for it. So they don't screw it up, and they know what you're going for. Okay, you got it, thank you. So you, you gotta, you got to create that bill of rights and you turn it over to them. And they got some guidelines. You may take it to where it's got to go. You know, it's part of, part of what I do is, is, and part of my success is I know what I know, I know what I don't know. When I start doing something I don't know, I get right back to doing something I do know. <laughs> and I remember one time an a industrial psychologist come in, I was doing some business with a, with a major corporation and, and uh, guy was a friend of mine and he said, listen, I'm, I'm having this guy come in and analyze some of my people. I think he wanted to fire some of his people. So he said, I got an extra spot. Would you, would you take it? So I spent a, a whole month with the guy on and off. You know, and I had a restaurant right across the street from this, this company and, and he came in and we spent a lot of time together. I remember one day he came in and he said, I want you to take this test. He put it on the end of my desk and I said, okay. He came back in about an hour or so. He said, you're done? Yeah, I finished just right there. So he takes it and he said, I'm going to be back in a month. I'm going to tell you all about yourself. I said, okay. He comes back in a month and he says, okay, I got some questions first. The first question is, remember I asked you if you finished that test? And he said, you said you did. I said, yeah, I answered, yeah, I did. He said, well, you only, you only answered 50% of the, the questions. I said, the things I answered, were they right? He says, yeah, you didn't get one wrong. I said, well, I didn't know the answers to the other ones. Why should I get them wrong? You know, when I'm in business and I need help from somebody, I get help. You know, I get an expert to give me the answers that I don't have. He said, wow. He said, I got you high superior as far as intelligence goes. But I, I stick to that, and I do that to this day. I don't practice law. You know, when I need help, I, I get help. You know, from somebody that knows more than I know. And I, hard to find that person, but... <laughs> but anyway, that's that's why that's why I I, I do things, you know, and, and um. Okay, next question. Okay, all right. So now we're going to move on to business best practices. What are the strategies and tactics and behaviors that Calvin and Phil have had that have made them successful, and how can we apply that to our own business? Question for Phil and for Calvin. What have you done differently from your competitors that has enabled your businesses to succeed? Well, I think that's the, that's the key to anything. Any business succeeding, it has to have a point of difference. It has to be different than everybody else. I mean, if I got there's 10 restaurants in a row, why are they going to come to my restaurant? What's going to bring them to my restaurant? They're going to come into my place because I got something different. I got a point of difference. What's people going to make you, going to look at you? You know, you're wearing something different. You look different, you act different, but you got to have a point of difference, even in your businesses. When you got to create that point of difference when you're when you're doing things, and you know, and when hiring people, that try to keep that point of difference. You, you hire people that, you know, it's like, well, you know, let me go back. Being an entrepreneur, you know, I really think is is survival of the unfittest, not survival of the fittest. Okay, I, I became an entrepreneur because I'm unfit. I I can't take orders. 
I don't want somebody else telling me what to do. I want to be able to control my own destiny. Somebody making decisions for me that uh, are going to depend on my livelihood. No way. I'm going to be responsible for my mistakes, and I want to be responsible for the rewards I'm going to be getting. So in order to do that, I never had a job. Since I got out of college, I created my own, I always paid my own paycheck. I couldn't work for anybody. So being an entrepreneur for me was, call it entrepreneurship or call it leadership. And every entrepreneur has to be a leader because he has to lead self, and he has to lead the team that he's, that he's got, got with him. And you try to look, look for somebody that that's, has that same instinct, you know, that wants to control their own destiny. That's, uh, uh, that's why we did this Trinity Groves down here. Why that works, and we got almost 20 restaurants we'll have here pretty soon. But we um, we got young entrepreneurs, people that want to control their own destiny, have their own business. We interviewed them, took them like a shark tank, and we put them in here. We help finance them. They're all young people. I call them new people, millennials. And I thought there's a market out there being millennials. You know, they think differently, are different, want different things and different kinds of restaurants and everything else. And so we interviewed them, listened to their concept. We had a committee of four or five guys in the business. And we talked, you know, talked to them, listened to their concept, listened to it. And in fact, we had young people with it too, listening to them. So make, because I didn't understand some of the things that these guys wanted to do. You know, not in that, in that bandwidth. But we finally said, okay, you come in, you could have a place. Okay. And the first thing they'd say, they'd throw their hands up in the air and say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a new person. I don't have $500,000. Because one of, the, one of the things they had to do is have, can't put more than $500,000 in the location. There's no guarantees on the lease. The locations are 2,500 square feet plus outside dining. they got to do at least $2 million in sales. Okay? And, they, and it's got to be owner-operated. So the first thing they say, oh, I don't have $500,000. So we went out to the community, okay, and we raised money. We got a fund that uh, has almost $14 million in the fund. And we said, okay, if we do, we'll give you them up to $500,000 to do your concept. If we do that, we will own 50% of your concept. And we'll be the general partners. We'll be there to help make you successful. We give them up. We charge them a 5% management fee, which is two and a half from them and two and a half from us. And we charge them a 6% rent from the get-go so they can manage it as it goes. And, and, and we put them in here. And if they don't succeed, they get the hook, and we got lined up to come back in and try it if they fail. So we constantly do it. It's, it's, it's out of the box. It's different. It's taking entrepreneurs. It's growing them. It's like most real estate people come out there and they try to find tenants, or we create our own tenants. If they're successful, we own 50% of it. Okay, and, and, and it's like, like creating new brands for the, for the next millennium. And that's what we're doing here, creating brands. But anyway, in, 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 in this, you get, you get to talk to these kids and mentor them and, and understand their, what they're thinking, what they're doing. And I've, and I've been doing that, and I've passed it on to them. I know I got off the track, but... That's okay. Calvin, over to you. Well, I, I, I agree with Phil in that point of distinction. And so I just want to try to remember, it was like 20 years ago when I went to my first um, Romano's Macri Grill. And the, the point of distinctions that I remember, and I'm sure there's a lot more, but the ones off the top of my head, and I haven't thought about this until just now. Like, I remember the waitresses were singing opera, I think. There was, I think there were... Um, uh, paper, white paper on, on top of the tables and you could draw or whatever. Um, there, I remember there was, like, there was like a wall of wine jugs and like all the wine was like cheap and accessible. And if you had a long line, people were, you know, pouring wine, just a long line just to come in and sit down. Everyone was like, well, I'll just get a little $5 glass of wine or something. And then all of a sudden you're willing to wait a little longer. And so when you walked into one of, and then think about Eatsies. If you've ever been to an Eatsies, you clearly understand that that was a very unique, absolutely differentiated vision from any other grocery experience you've ever had in your life. But the, the interesting thing though is that Phil literally created those out of nothing. He literally thought something like, what would I want? 
this experience to me. And then he went and did it. And there's another guy that did that. His name is Steve Jobs. He invented his, uh, uh, well, many things, but we can talk about the iPod, because he was sick of using CDs. He, as a music listener and lover, was sick of using CD players and the crappy, you know, um, physically m m mechanical components of portable CD players and disc mints and things like that. So he literally just made something that he liked himself. And it turned out that that confidence in, 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 what, in what you want and his ability to stick to exactly what he wanted, he had a Bill of Rights that he stuck to, um, it allowed him to create something that no one else could have created because it literally came out of, out of Steve Jobs' mind for his passion of, of music. Calvin, one of the things, one of the most powerful messages I've heard from you is really loving the things that you do, loving your work. Tell us how has that impacted your career and is that a practical strategy for everyone? So uh, I used to say, love what you do. Now I say, do what you love. And I feel the second way of saying it, um, which is to jump, you know, moving the words around, it is more empowering to the person. Um, but whichever one you want to believe, like love what you're doing now or love what you do or, or go and do something you love, I actually do believe that every single person on the planet could do what something that they love. I do think that. I, but, the, the, but the stark reality is I think probably 90% don't. I mean, in a, in a huge number. It might be 98%. I don't know. But let's just say 90%. And a lot of times they don't realize they're not doing something they love. It's they, they get into something maybe earlier in their in their in their in their in their life and their career and maybe it's the job that they could get at the time and all of a sudden it, it set forth you know building resume experience in this particular industry or this particular role and whatnot and it's hard to let those things go especially when you get a little later in life and you've got little ones that might be dependent on you and others in your life that might be dependent on you you have to just kind of keep that gravy train going but. That's, so that's not about love. That's about upholding responsibilities or whatever you want to call it. When you focus on what you absolutely love to do, you will do it better than anyone else on the planet. And if you're lucky enough to do something you love that the world needs, you can build an amazing business around that. And you can build something bigger than yourself. I believe that everyone's purpose is the intersection, the point where the, these next two things intersect. The, the world's needs and your loves. And if you can list out the things that you love to do and, and get you excited, and I don't necessarily mean, you know, hobbies and things like that, but everything. I get excited when I close a deal, or I get excited when I meet a new potential client, or I get excited when, when we recruit um, the best and the brightest, or I get excited when someone comes to my office and says, I've never learned more in my career than I've learned here at Bottle Rock. Those are things that, that, that I love. So, and the world needs that. Like, employees want to matter. We all want to matter. The best employees always are looking for a new challenge. And so we, we've done it in the market of the world needs the services that Bottle Rocket provides, and we love to provide them. But we also do that um, in a more granular way with each of our employees. What does the company need? bottle rocket and what does the rocketeer love to do and if we find that intersection they will do the best work of their life and if we make them do something they don't love to do they're not going to do it as best as the person who loves to do it so why are you asking them to do it thank you calvin phil question for you you are the only person in the restaurant business that has created more than two national concepts to date you've created six what is the one commonality that made all six of those businesses successful? The Bill of Rice. <laughs> I think, yeah, it, it's, uh, again, Kevin, I mean, uh, Calvin hit it on, on the head when he said, you know, the world needs that. You know, you, you're doing something that the world needs, you're fulfilling a need. An entrepreneur makes people happy, satisfies their needs, makes their life more comfortable, and gives them things that they need to have and they want. You're doing that, you're going to be successful. Like, for example, Fuddruckers. 
you know, at the time, uh, I thought the world needed a better hamburger. I love hamburgers, you know, back to love. What I love to do, I love to eat hamburgers. And McDonald's, that quarter pounder that they were making when I was in college, you no, know, it was the same when I got out of college. But what wasn't the same was the price. It was twice as much as it was when I was in college. But the sin they did, or committed, was they didn't change their product and make it better. They charged twice as much and didn't make their product better. They didn't improve it. Because, ah, there's a, a kink in their armor. I'm going to create a better burger, bigger, better, take all the milkshakes out, put the long neck beers in there, take the clowns out, make a better hamburger, make it in front of them, <laughs> you know, and, and serve, that, serve that need out there. And again, I gave it a constitution before it even started. I said, what are the five most important things going to be about this? One you know, is the beef. Well, I'm going to grind my own beef, put it behind glass so people can see it being ground up. Okay? The, the, the perception of freshness. You want fresh? Well, you can see the meat hanging up 15 minutes later. You're going to be eating that same piece of meat being ground up and cooked. And it's going to be cooked in front of you. So it's going to be cooked the way you want to. That's the second thing, how it's going to be cooked. The third was the buns. The buns we had baked right there. You can see the buns being baked. They come across hot. They're on it. Okay, and the next thing was what you put on it. It's your hamburger. Put your own stuff on it. Don't shut, let the chef put it on. So we had a produce area. They put, they put on their product. Then the place you eat it in. That's important. I mean, where's, where's a hot dog taste better? The Bob Parker at home. So what you got to do here is we made that so we wanted to be in high density areas. There's a lot of apartments where we're at. And what's the departments? They don't have backyards. We go in the backyard and have a burger or cook or something like that. So we put a patio in the backyard of every place we went. So they could come in there and get a, a bucket of beer, you know, six beers for the price of five. Get out there. They got the burger that they had part, making part of it because they put what they want to put on it. They go out to have the hamburger, have the beers and everything else. Well, there was a need for that. We satisfied that need and we keep it, kept it going. Today, that hamburger is the same. They, you know, they, they, they fudge on Every time I sell a concept, you know, it happens that they take it and they got to, excuse the expression, they got to piss on it and make it theirs, change things, you know. And, and, and it, if it wasn't, why'd you buy it if you, if you were going to change it? Create your own. But, you know, they, they change it around a little bit, but they still maintain the key parts, that my, my five kind of things, but they change them a little bit. And it's still there. It's still got a good hamburger and all, but... It's, um, you know, it's, my concept of got to, again, satisfy a need. Things change. Somebody just asked me uh, just a couple minutes ago, you know, private club, what's that about? Well, things change. And I went from a big market to a small market and got to create my own demand here. Because people want safe places to go now. You know, they want, times have changed, a safe place. They want people like themselves together. Grouping, everything's tribal today. And I want a tribe of business people here making connections and going so forward with it. So things change and so do what I, what I do change. So you gotta meet the demands that are out there, but you gotta understand them, you know. A good entrepreneur, you know, I call them leaders also because they gotta lead the way. Good entrepreneurs are, are people that are opportunists. They gotta see an opportunity out there. At the opportunity for the ha better hamburger. I saw an opportunity. Bing, I did it. Macaroni Grill. They have the first chef-driven multiple concept out there. Casual food. And I did that the way I grew up. You know, in an Italian home, you know, and uh, walking in the kitchen and eating in the kitchen, walk through the kitchens and original ones and, and everything else, what we were doing there, you know, the opera singers and the jug of wine my grandfather used to put on the table. Well, I, I brought that because there was a demand out there. People wanted that. Get back to basics, you know. So anyway, it, it, it's it's giving it a constitution and meeting the world needs. Next question is for both. We'll start with Calvin. What is one skill that you wish you would have learned sooner that would have made you more effective earlier on in your career? Uh, empathy. So I think empathy is um, really powerful. And it's powerful 
um, for the person with the empathy because they can, they can truly connect with and feel what the other person is feeling and, and then they have the ability to put themselves in that person's seat. So for example, you know, we've been talking about, you know, what does the world need? Sometimes the world doesn't tell you what it needs. Sometimes you have to sense what is needed. So no one was knocking on Steve Jobs' door saying, you know, music distribution sucks. He just said, this isn't any good. <laughs> and as soon as he said that, he started seeing other people say, ah, I hate this disc, man. It breaks every year. I have to buy another $120 disc, man, or whatever it is. And so I think that sensing um, uh, important as aspect of a leader I don't think I had that until probably in my late 30s, and, and I'm 47 today. And so the my 20s, which I was running businesses that I had started, I've always started and run businesses. Only had only been able to hold one job for one year, and that was it. <laughs> and then someone someone told me to do something I didn't want to do, and I said, "I got to go by." <laughs> um, and so I was more transactional, tit for tat. What do I need from you? What do I need from you? What do you owe me? What's, what's fair for me in our, in our interaction? And when you turn that around and you start to exercise empathy, which you might naturally have, or it might come hard to you, um, you are able to look at the world in a totally different way because you're able to put yourself in the shoes of your customer in the shoes of your supplier, in the shoes of your employees, et cetera, et cetera. And you can make a better decision because it's not just informed by your way of thinking, it's informed by the other stakeholders' way of thinking. You know, that, that's a good point, uh, Calvin. You know, in, in the restaurant business, we call it, you know, human dignity. You know what human dignity is? It's treating people like you like to be treated. You reprimand people like you like to be reprimanded, and you tell people, give order, people like you like to have orders given to you. Well, in our business, we have customer dignity. Okay, with a customer. Customers at a table, if they have a problem, what do you do? If we tell our waiters and waitresses, they're the most powerful people we got in our restaurant because they touch their customers. And they got the whole restaurant at their disposal the chefs, the waiters, the bartenders, everybody, the managers at their disposal to make that customer happy. So what do we do? We tell them to think for themselves. We give them the leeway. We say, okay, what you gotta do, put yourself in the customer's place. What would you want done if that happened to you? And do it. Okay, same thing, empathy. And that, that's important, that's, that's, that's the key to everything, you know, human dignity. So one of my favorite quotes of all time is a quote by Jim Rohn. And Jim says, you cannot change the winds, but you can change the set of the sail. And he likens the set of the sail to your philosophy, because it's your philosophy that allows you to navigate through the challenges that we face in life. So I'd like to close with one final topic, which is about business and life philosophy. Question for Calvin. Calvin, I've heard you say, don't have priorities, have a purpose. What does this mean? So, you know, a lot of people say, like, I've got too many things on my to-do list and I'm, and I'm going to have to prioritize them. And, and then what you're doing is you're basically a, attempting to do all of it, but in just, in just in a certain order. And it's hard to really know what's more important than the other. And it's also even harder to have the discipline to focus on the most important thing. There's another quote I love. I hope you love it too, but you'll have to really sit with it like for weeks or months and then it'll kind of, the power it has in my life will come to you. <laughs> As a leader, the most important thing is to keep the most important thing the most important thing. And it's a mantra. It's a mantra. And you lit, it's, it's a practice. You literally have to practice every day. You don't meditate once, you meditate every day. You don't work out once, you try to work out as much as you can, that sort of thing. You don't eat well just one time, you try to do it all the time. You're not just nice to people on Mondays. You try to be nice to people and be respectful seven days a week. So the idea of, of this priority and purpose is it goes like this. 
If you're really clear on what your purpose is, meaning like, what can you do better than anyone else on the planet? What is your true gift? And if you only do those things, you do not need to prioritize because everything you're doing is just as important as everything else you're doing, but you're doing significantly fewer things. A practical way to use this in the context of business, if you are a person who finds themselves stretched, you know, in a million different directions, it's a simple exercise that someone had me do like 20 years ago called ABC. A is the th you list out, actually you list out everything you do in, in any day, in any week or any month, just pick a period of time. And it could be something as simple as answering emails, going to lunch, um, uh, taking my dry cleaning, you know, to the dry cleaner, literally everything. So you'll have like a couple of hundred things. And then you go through and you put A next to the things that you really do believe you're the only one who can do this. You're really the only one who can take a shower, right? <laughs> or you're the only one, well, I mean, oh, hold on, it could be, okay, it could be a group thing. <laughs> Now that's on film, great. Uh, <laughs> exactly right. Uh, where the hell was I? <laughs> I was in the shower. A are the things that only you can do. It's exercising your gift to the world. B is something that you're pretty damn good at. But there's probably someone else in your organization or in the world that's better at it than you. It's a competency. It's not a gift. It's a like. It's not a love. And then the third one is this is something that I could easily find someone else to do. I could easily find someone to go uh, to run some errands. Um, I could easily find someone else to, you know, find, you know, great people to and compel them to to um, apply to Bottle Rocket or that sort of thing. And then as a leader, you focus on the A's. You immediately have a discipline and set a date, nothing measured gets done. You set a date on when you're gonna have all your C's out, either to people who work for you, people you work for, um, uh, uh, or um, outside partners and experts in, 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 in you know, various service lines. The B's, it takes a little longer. That might take you like six months to, to really wear, wear down that, that list, that, that B's. And you might not actually ever get the B's completely offloaded, but it would be better if you did. And then every day you focus on the A's. You delay the B's, you don't do the C's, you focus on the A's. Phil? Something that you have referred back to over and over that has made you successful are your values and specifically your Bill of Rights. What are the values that make up your Bill of Rights so we could learn and apply them in our own lives? All right, you know, I got my, I got my son sitting here. He just graduated from college, Syracuse University. He was a lacrosse player up there. And I brought him up like a business, you know, I was successful. I created my own businesses and I want to create my son and let him be what he has to be. So I used to drive him to school every morning. And uh, maybe it was about a 15 minute ride. And we would talk. You know, remember that ad you used to see in a paper, you know, or on TV about if you got time to talk to your, your, your child, you should talk to him about drugs and about this and about that. Well, I told him, I said, Sam, there's five things you have to be in order to be a good person. Number one, you got to have principles. We talked about that. We ended up that principles were sticking to your deal, doing what you said you were going to do. Second is responsibility. Be responsible for making the right decision and be responsible for the consequences if you don't. Number three was integrity. You got to have integrity. You got to be honest, truthful. You don't lie. And you don't lie to yourself. Number four is to communicate. You gotta tell people how you feel. Don't let them tell you how you should feel. Don't let them tell you anything about what you should be doing or what you should be doing. You make up your own mind and you tell them how you feel and how you, how you think. Think for yourself. And number five has three things in it. One, God. 
Second, charity. And third, patriotism. I said, have all these things and, and you're going to be the right kind of person you're supposed to be now. Who are you going to pick for friends? You're going to pick people that have that same attitude, the same value system. And if they have that value system, they're going to pick you as a friend. Now you've got a peer group you're going to be existing in. Keep you out of trouble, get you motivated, and do things together. And these are the kind of friends you're going to choose. And they're going to choose you as a friend. And then we took it a step further and made an organizational chart for him and the whole thing. And <laughs> <laughs> but, but, and, and in fact, I got, a, I, got a whole, I got a bunch of them over here. You're welcome to them. But the organizational chart on the very top, I got the most important thing, your health. Without your health, you can't have anything. You come down way over the left of your parents, and I got a whole list of things your parents are supposed to provide for you. The next one? is your, um, your academia, what that's supposed to do for you, okay, what you get out of academia. The next one is your girlfriend, relationships, or boyfriends, <laughs> figuring out, you know, what they're going to get out of that, you know, relationships and learn about love and learn about all that kind of stuff. And the third is, is athletics, what's that going to do for you, you know, prestige and teamwork and all that kind of stuff. And the one layover, the, the last one over there, your friends, what are they going to do for you? Well, they do certain things. And when you get out of college, they change. Your parents aren't important anymore. Academia becomes your job and your career. Your girlfriend becomes your, your family unit. Athletics is what you're going to keep you in shape and keep you healthy. And your friends are where you're going to exist in. You're going to be doing business with them. You're going to be socializing with them. You're going to games with their kids and raising kids together. You know, going through life with them funerals and happiness and all that, just share all that with him. But that's your life. He's got a pathway to follow. He's got a route to go. You know, so I, I gave him that, and, and it worked out just fine. He, he ended up being a good person. He's got, he's got the, the basics to go to that. But I guess that the same thing. Now, you take that value system, any good, successful business today has to have those. Okay? It has to have principles. It's got to be responsible. It's got to communicate its message. It's got to have, it's got to have integrity. It's got to have patriotism, believe in God, okay, and charity. Same thing. You know, individual, that personality. You call the personality, it's all the value system. But that's how I, that's how I, how I use that. And, I, and uh, my son is a prime example of the results. Thank you, Phil. Final question for you both. How has success in business shaped your approach to life? And we'll start with you, Phil. Well, it's made me, made me realize that, uh, again, doing things that I, I could do. I, I, by the things I've done, I realized that I'm, a, I'm creative. I got a lot of awards for being creative and innovator of the year and different things all, all my life. And I, I look at it, and, and I maybe. I got a, I got an award as innovator of the year. I got it three times, I think, from the hotel restaurant people and in my industry at the time. And, and and I look at all the different businesses that I've been in. You know, from the, the heart stent, I saved lives with the heart stent. You know, it made me feel good. You know, it's a different deal. Uh, medical field, I changed that a little bit with that. And uh, you know, the real estate business, I'm. I mean, in fact, I think with this place on the real estate. But anyway, I, I think it's, it's taught me to be creative. And I gave a speech one time, the shortest speech I ever gave when I got Innovator of the Year. And I said, you know, being creative is a, anybody can be creative. Some people are more creative than others. Everybody can play baseball. Some people can play baseball better than other people. But being real creative, I think, is a gift from God. And using that gift is a gift back to God. Okay, so they say, when am I going to quit? When am I going to stop doing it? Well, when, I, when I'm not able to give gifts back to God, when I'm not creative anymore. But what I have done is, you know, I'm an artist. Uh, I got a gallery on, on um, Dragon Street, Samuel Lane Galleries. I got my own law for I do my painting, big paintings. And, and, I, and I got it for a purpose. You know, technology is passing me by. It's gone. I don't, I don't understand it. I don't, I don't want to, and it's something I don't know, so I get somebody else to do it. 
Back to, I know what I know and know what I don't know. I don't have time to waste trying to learn it. So, but, so it's passing me by. When I com become completely useless and people, I don't understand how people do business now because it's all computers and emails and all that kind of stuff going for it. So I'm going to pass the baton, get out, and just go down to my studio and paint. Now I'm doing something that they can't do. <laughs> I always got the edge, you know, down there. So, and I could, you know, I sell a lot of art, and it's, uh, so I could, I could quasi make a living and feel good. But even, even the money that I get for my pieces, there was someone would get thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars a piece for my art. It's not the money that makes me happy. It's the applause. People liked what I did. I made them happy enough. I made them happy enough to pull thirty-five thousand dollars out of their pocket and pay for it. Wow. You know, it's the wow factor. It made me feel good to be able to do that and satisfy, satisfy somebody to the point where they were to pay for it. So it's not the same thing you do a, uh, just like after you go after you got enough money you, or wealth and you've been successful enough. It's it's not the you know I, I did things three parts of my life. I did things the first part of my life. I did things to make money. I wanted power. The second phase of my life, I did things to get social recognition for it. People knew what I was doing in my restaurants. The third phase of my life, which I'm in now, I do things for intrinsic value. I do things that make me feel good. I got a charity. I, I, got, I help people. I mentor, <laughs> put this thing together for young people. That, doing things that make me feel good, making a difference. I consider myself a mad person, M-A-D. I get up in the morning mad. During the day, I try to make people mad. At nighttime, I go to bed saying, wow, you know what? I, I, I sleep better knowing who I made mad. Think about what I made mad. Mad, M-A-D, making a difference. And that's what I try to do, make a difference in the world, make it a different place than when I got here. Now, I got a little perk. I got a book coming out. It should be out in about two, two months. It's called The Mad Entrepreneur, making a difference in, in, in the world and, and business and in life. And there's a lot of life stories in it and different things that really have happened, experiences and stuff. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And we my second book. And, and um, so anyway, I'm, it'll be coming out. And, I'll let you know when. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Calvin, over to you. This is the philosophy? Yes. How has success in business shaped your approach and philosophy towards life? Okay. So I, I think that um, when I was coming out of college and in my 20s and starting my first businesses and things like that, I think I leaned more towards scarcity on the scarcity abundance spectrum. And, you know, there's a lot of people that are centered in one or the other. So there are people you'll meet in your life that naturally sit on the abundant side. And you'll meet others in your life that are naturally on the scarcity side. So this, a scarcity thinker is like, well, there's not enough money in the world, so I better get as much as I can for myself. There's, there's only so many leads, I better get the, the Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross leads. I don't want the other ones because we'll run out of leads. We'll run out of this. There is a scarcity to this or that or the other. However, um, maybe by living a little longer or, or what I believe is you know, you know, seeing for myself that the world is very abundant. There is plenty to go around. We just have to sit down and work together to, to, to do that. But there's plenty to go around. And it also, I believe, makes you um, be less frenetic or less frantic, if you would, in, in the decisions that you make when you're like, hey, listen, if, if this opportunity isn't uh, the right one, then we'll find another opportunity. It's better to do that than do the wrong opportunity. It's more damaging your business to take on the wrong client than to, to, to wait for the right client. And, and so I think it has kind of calmed me down, a little more zen feeling, um, because the world is an abundant place and it's got enough for all of us. Thank you, Calvin. Ladies and gentlemen, can we give a big round of applause to Calvin Carter and Phil Romano.
so here I was, a little bit nervous that we weren't going to make it out on time, but we actually have five minutes left. Does anyone from the audience have questions for either Calvin or Phil? Anyone? Don't be shy. I got a mic. <laughs> Attached to my hip. Attached to my hip, because I got to leave this one here. You got one right here in the back, sir? Yeah, good, good question. What we do is, once you establish something, get it going. Got to get it going first. You know, you pre-plan it, but you get it going. And you look at it and you get your employees together, your customers, yourself, and you talk about it. What are the most important things about this? And you establish them. Okay? It's like looking at it and say, wow, what are the things that made me, made me successful? And you got to be stupid not to keep on doing the things that made you successful. You, know, you weed them out, and, you, and this is what you got to do. What, what makes you a better person? What makes you a good person? Understand them and, and, and do them. Don't do something else. But it, it's, uh, yeah, it's a process you go through. You get everybody involved that, that that's, understands what they're doing with you, and, and, and you come up with it. And you, you, you pin it, you put it out there, make it, you know, not implied, but explicit. Little cards, put them in their pocket. They got to keep them. They look at them. You ask them questions. But, you know, to get it going. Thank you for your question. Who's next? Albert. Jody. Um, when, when you bring on a new hire, what is the number one quality you look for in that person? And how do you draw that quality out during the interview process? I, either. <laughs> Sorry, either. Um, oh, okay, I got you know, when you when you hire somebody, talking to hiring somebody or getting somebody involved with you, you know, they got to have that the desire. And if you if you got it, you understand it. You know, I could I could I could see it in people because that's I know what I'm like, and I see what if they got the same virtues, but. Person comes to me and, and they want to make me. I I got kids to come to come on, Mr. Romano. I want to work for you. I want to make you rich. I said, me? What about yourself? Don't you care about yourself? Why do you want to make me rich? You want to make me better, more most, most successful. And I look at people what they did with their own life. If they can't do it in their own life for themselves, how could they do it for me? What have you done? You've graduated from college. Have you done anything successful? Have you done this? Have you done that? What are some of the things you do? What do you do? What do you contribute? Did you make a difference in, in anybody's life? If you can't do that for yourself, then how could you do it for somebody else? I mean, I sit down, if I'm going to make a difference in somebody else's life, i got to have the capabilities of doing it in my life first. So I look at what they've done and how they've done it. Another thing, too, I think is that, and I remember I talked to Kelvin about this. I called him up and we talked about it. And I said, you know, when you hire these young, young people, they want, they want a couple things they want. One is they want to be, they want to be heard. These millennials, they want to be heard. They want their voice heard. They want to. They want to contribute. You know, and they don't want to belong. So I said, one day you want upward mobility. So you hire them, you promote within, you get them going. But what you do is, you brainstorm, and all good ideas come from young people. We do. We do Shark Tanking in here. You know, with young people, their ideas. We try to raise money for them and get going with it because they got the ideas. They see it. That's their. That's their. That's their marketplace. So you you look at what what these people are doing, what they want, and everything else, and you try to provide it for them. But the young people, I told Kevin, Kelvin, you have, have your brain, have your culture in your business where you could have somebody that's got a good idea, you know, and, and they want to be an entrepreneur, they want to contribute. So you come up and they, they get somebody in a company or your lawyers or something to, to get with these people. Get their idea, can it, and protect it for them. Then let them have it presented to the company. If the company adopts it and goes with it, let them get 10% of what it saves the company. If it saves the company a million dollars a year, they get a $10,000 check every year, or $100,000 check every year. Now they're like having entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs within your company, trying to make your company better. You know, things like this is what these people want. They need that need. Then you don't have them going off, starting their own business. They got a good idea, they're going to start their own business. Why do it? You can be in business in this company and profit by it. 
you know, things like this, you got you got to have a program that's going to be just going to motivate them, okay, and and help the company, help everybody for all for one and one for all. I I'd say um, one of the things that uh, um, that Phil just talked about was uh, this idea of like if you can't do it for yourself, well, why can't? How do you think you're going to do it for me? Well, and one of the number one questions we ask in our interviews, we look for a lot of things, but one of the number one things we look for is do they really love what they're, what they're applying to do for us? Do they really love it? And then one of the easiest way to find out the truth is to say, so, um, and let's say I'm talking to um, an engineer and I say, well, I see there's a lot of um, web technology stuff on your, but you're, you want to do native Android. And they're like, well, yeah, yeah, I think that's where the world's going. I'm like, okay, great. Well, I, you know, we agree. But um, so, what have you done? Well, I've I've been looking for a job, uh, so that I can go and do that. I'm like, ah, you don't work here, because the person who works at Bottle Rocket would say, well, I mean, it's nothing special. But I built this and I built that and I learned this from there. And I'm I'm not that proud of everything I've done. It's just, but I'm being honest. This is what I've done so far. <clears throat> like. Did someone pay to do this? No, I just, just, I'm just doing it at nights, weekends, just, you know, trying to learn. I'm like, hired. You will do the best work of your, of your life here because you love what you do, and we're just going to have you focus on the things you love to do. I love it. Thank you, Calvin. Anyone else? In the back. Hey, it's not really a question, but it's for Phil specifically. So he's talking, he talked about really, he talked about his 25 concepts that everybody knows about. Talk about his proudest concept, his son, but he hasn't talked about his second most proudest concept that I don't think most people know about, and how he saw an opportunity and turned it into an eight hundred million dollar company. You want to talk about that one? You talk about the stent? Yes, sir. Yeah, this is an interesting story. You know, I just sold, got out of Fuddruckers, had a whole bunch of money in the bank, and and what the hell am I going to do with it? So I said, well, you know, I was worried about putting it all in one bank and this and that stuff. So anyway, I started, I started looking at investments to do. And this one doctor came to me. I was at the country club and we were talking. He was just a young guy. Um, he was in, still uh, in his uh, fellowship as a cardiologist at uh, Fort Sam Houston. And he said he met this guy at, at UT Health Science Center in, in, in uh, San Antonio. He's a radiologist and invented this little thing called the stent. And he said, uh, the university doesn't want to fund it anymore. It's, and, and we talked to some companies, they don't want it. He says, I really think it's good. We've been putting it in dogs and, and baboons and stuff and it's working and looking good. So he said, well, come on down and uh, take a look at it. So I went down and met Julio, who was the, the doctor he was talking about, the guy he's working with. Who when I brought my attorneys and my accountants with me, we looked at the deal, and the first thing they said was, don't do it. And I said, like, wait a minute, I'm going to do it. <laughs> Two things why. One, you know, I like the doctors, and I said, it's got sex appeal. You know, everybody has a heart, everybody abuses it, and there's no solution for it. So I'm going to do it. I'm going to put in... $250,000. This is back in 85. And the other reason why I did it, because the government at the time, you could write off R&D. Okay, a little motivator. That's just gone now. You know, you can't, it doesn't incentivize you like it did before. Or else probably I wouldn't have done that. So I did it. I was told not to do it, and I did it. And that Born a partnership, we sold it to Johnson and Johnson. They paid us ten million dollars cash up front. I ended up owning 33 percent of the company, and Julio uh, had fifty-two, and Shatz had the rest of it. Richard Shatz was the doctor that brought it to me. So within a year, we sold it for ten million dollars with certain milestones. We hit the milestones, and then we sold it to Johnson and Johnson, and um, brought it to the marketplace and. Over a period of about five years, it brought us in about almost $700 million, of which I had 30% of. And that was the royalty. I, 
I was able to negotiate the highest royalty ever with uh, Johnson & Johnson. They paid a 10% royalty on the, on the stent. And uh, it worked out just fine. But again, uh, it's something that I think one of my... <laughs> One of my, yeah, well, one of my, one of my uh, make a difference deals there. It, it makes a difference in everybody's life. People come to me, I, got, you know, I found out I did it, and I got, I got one, I got two of them in me, matter of fact. Thirty years after, I got a home up in New York State. You know, I was running up the hills, and I was jogging in the morning. Hard to take a deep breath, and I had a, like heartburn, so I called my radio, my. Uh, my uh, cardiologist, you know, and Mark Jenkins, and I said, Mark, I, said, I think I need one of my stents. <laughs> and he told me, I told him, he said, okay, sent me something, got on my plane, got back down to Dallas, got here at 7 o'clock in the morning, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, I had two stents in me. Okay. The next day, I was back up there, and two days after that, I was going up running again, like a 20-year-older. You know, it's like, like eating my own food 30 years after, after I cooked it, you know, so I say to myself, wow, that's, that's a pretty good investment, you know, it saved my life and saved a lot of other people's lives, it made the world a different place. <laughs> Thanks for the question. <laughs> hey, what do you call that? You call that lateral integration? <laughs> it's, what, yeah, yeah, <laughs> lateral integration, that's right. Well, you know, it's like, at the time, I just got out of Fuddruckers, and I'm making everybody diseased with the hamburgers. <laughs> I was crazy. <laughs> I was creating my own market, my own demand. <laughs> Any other final questions before we wrap up for the afternoon? In that case, on behalf of the InSource Group, the Network Bar, and Bottle Rocket, we thank you all very much for coming.